Hello, Yaniv. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Moshe. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So we always jump into the uh, what what your company does right away. So why don't you tell us what is AnyWord and who do you serve? AnyWord is a copy intelligence platform and an AI writing assistant. Um, it's built for marketers and marketing teams, um, and it's built for what we call performance writing. So if in the past you'd write, I don't know, two emails or three tweets and A-B test them and see which one worked best and then push that one out the most. Now with LMs, you basically have to like, you can generate 1,000 emails with a click of a button and you really have to know to write the right one. You can't really A-B test 1,000 emails. So the whole mission, our whole purpose is to help you um, choose that right, uh, that right uh, copy variation. And we specifically are focused on, on short form copy. So that's kind of like our, our sweet spot. So uh, emails, ads, social posts. Um, and we, we're, we, do, uh, we have like this data-driven product that helps you target uh, your copy really well. Every word really matters. In short form, that's to contrast against blog posts, longer form uh, content. Is that right? Yeah, like everything that actually moves the needle is measurable as far as uh, conversion rate and engagement and things you can put in your website or, or in any kind of like messaging. Um, we have a lot of <clears throat> kind of like our own, our own data and we match that with yours about your historical performance. And then we help you um, craft the right messages for your audience, your channel, and your business goal. And, and SEO and, and kind of like long form articles is, is, is more of how to win with Google, and, and that's less. And that we, we we do that too, but that's not our uh, sweet spot and focus. Cool. Well, we'll come back to that in a bit, but I'd love to learn a little bit more about the company and your background. Um, you guys didn't just recently come out of the woodworks with uh, you know everybody else that's that's uh, raising their hand in this new AI um, uh, renaissance right now. You've been at this for a while, so can you rewind us to the the history of AnyWord and how you guys started? So AnyWord is basically a spinoff of a company. We started, uh, me and uh, co-founders, uh, Adam and Ariel, uh, back in 2013. That company is called Kiwi. It's still uh, doing well. Uh, Kiwi is a um, SaaS platform and a managed service for publishers. Um, it helps them to um, <clears throat> basically distribute their, their content to their, the right audiences. So New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, NBC. Um, once they write an article, then they basically have to push it out. And typically they'll do it with social posts, but also with, with ads. And we and, any, and Kiwi was the platform that helped them do that. And basically from, <clears throat> from building that around 2018, we, we kind of noticed that some of our customers were doing way better than others. Like they're writing more copy and they, and they knew their audience better. And it wasn't necessarily the bigger partners or publishers that were doing well. Um, and they were like spending, I don't know, $50,000 a day on an article just to push it out. But they wrote two tweets. And even if they wrote 10 of them, they weren't really good. Um, and we thought that we can help them, you know, solve that problem with... Uh, with AI and uh, my background and, and a lot of people at, at uh, Anywhere Today and Kiwi back then was, was AI and natural language processing. And, um, you know, so you have a hammer, everything's a nail. And it's like, okay, we can, we can basically try to codify, you know, copy that performs and we can measure it and we have lots of data and we can train models. And initially it was super hard, right? So you, you, you didn't have, your know, large language models weren't that large. They had like context issues. And even if you took like, like something that somebody at a publisher, like a, a tweet that someone wrote, you had to rewrite it. Even keeping, you know, context and, 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 and the text grammatically correct was, 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 was not easy. Um, it took us a while. Eventually we solved it. And um, uh, we didn't just solve it where we're writing the copy, uh, more copy variations. We're actually writing, we're doing a better job than the actual writer. So we, we kept on testing it, and um, turns out that predicting copy performance is super hard, even for experts, right? So we had a, at Kiwi, we had a, an in-house team. Uh, we still have one of, of uh, copywriters, 
and we tested how well they knew what copy would outperform in A-B tests. And they're kind of like slightly over 50%, like slightly over random. So if you give them a pair of copy uh, variations, they do. They 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 know sometimes or or more more times than others what will work better, and they also didn't agree with themselves. So like if you gave them the same pairs like after three months, they weren't that consistent. So it's super hard to guess what will work. But turns out that if you you train an algorithm um, or an, uh, you know LLM um, and you have the right data, and we had amazing data, like the world's best writers writing you know uh, for all, over a long time. Um, and A-B testing, um, you can um, pretty accurately predict what will work. Today, we're at 82% accuracy. So if you give a model copy variations it hasn't seen before and you know which one would work, kind of like predict which one is better. Um, and it's getting better all the time. So. Accuracy with regards to the prediction. Yes, exactly. And, and I think I saw um, a... A data point from you from a little while ago that 70% of the top publishers were using uh, Kiwi at one point um, in use, to, to optimize their, their content performance, right? Yeah, Kiwi uh, is basically working, still is with most of the top publishers in the US and North America. And are, are you still uh, running that company simultaneously or is that, uh, are you, you focused on AnyWord? So there's a different team now, new uh, you know, CEO, different R&D, different product. They have a different go-to-market. Once we kind of like thought that we can solve this, uh, you know, just a Facebook post or a tweet or something small like that, we, like, we, we can pretty much apply um, our methodology and our data across all forms of, of, of performance writing. And there's just so many use cases. And so we... We um, at that point we spun out any word and, and today I, I work just on, on any word and kind of like the company split. There's around sixty of us, likely more, forty uh, team the teams forty people in any word and around twenty in Kiwi, um, <clears throat> and um, any words focused on on marketing teams and, and 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 extracting the data from your organization, teaching your LLM how to write uh, better copy for your audience based on your data and our data. And Kiwi is, is, is more than copywriting. Kiwi is, uh, is focused on the entire distribution uh, of content for, um, for publishers. Got it. You mentioned they have a different go-to-market. So Kiwi is uh, more of an enterprise product, right? You're selling to large publishers. Um, talk to me about the go-to-market for any word. Is it product-led motion? Is it a combination of product-led and sales-led? Um, how have you uh, grown? And I think you've just reached a million users. So huge congratulations for on that milestone. It's amazing. Thank you. Um, yeah, anywhere's product growth. One hundred percent of our uh, yeah, our enterprise sales are and and and, and consumer sales are inbound. Um, and Kiwi was sales sales led growth and enterprise focused. And we were looking at so we've been thinking about uh, this problem from a business perspective and from a technical perspective for around five years now. So where we, so we were 100% sure that even in the early days of LMs, like, like when you use, like, use GPT-2 or BERT, like really uh, much smaller models with, with, with uh, limitations, we were sold that this is going to write everything. Like this, this, this technology is going to help marketers write uh, better. And most of what you're going to be reading is either AI-assisted or AI-written. We're trying to sell, like, convince people that there was like skepticism today. There's, there's, there's not that much skepticism. But when we uh, kind of like, thought about this problem, I was like, okay, oh, now we have to. How are we gonna? Uh, what's our, what's our um, go-to-market gonna be? Yeah, pretty clear that if you have a, a product that you can understand in like five minutes, text in, text out, um, you have an opportunity to 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 build this uh, PLG free trial, freemium motion, and, um, and uh, we, we had to take advantage of that. So we are now, you know, we rank really high in, in searches. Um, uh, we got a lot of really positive reviews and, um, and that's kind of like a, a flywheel that keeps uh, um, helping us out. Great. And, you know, product-led growth still requires some sort of inbound uh, channel acquisition channel for people to hear about you. Obviously, the adoption happens um, mostly uh, user led. So to drive those users to the site, you mentioned uh, inbound SEO. Uh, that's been an important factor. Um, you have a ton of really great reviews. I noticed on 
on G2. You have a thousand plus uh, reviews for a 4.8 4. star rating, which is really good. Trustpilot as well, 4.8 stars, Captera. Um, what did you do to drive? Well, did you, did you do any uh, focused efforts to get more reviews, um, possibly incentivizing um, users, customers to uh, write positive reviews? And I guess just taking a step back, what would you point to um, to suggest why customers seem to love the product so much, right? And they're they're raving about it to that to that extent. So that's kind of like an interesting uh, kind of like um, question. Um, the first one, first of all, yes, we invested in in in, in reviews and and uh, um, you know triggered or prompted our, our users to 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 give us good reviews. Um, sometimes offer some some um, um, access to new functionality or more features, and and really invested in that uh, early on. Um, and 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 traffic comes organically, but also we do um, uh, paid acquisition. Obviously, we eat our own uh, our own dog food, um, and uh, we optimize landing pages copy and the ads copy. Um, what drives people to kind of like uh, uh, like any word is 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 a moving target because the the space is is changing so rapidly. So early on, we were saying we're going to the to market and say, hey, we can tell you which one of these work better, and our value, our our, our promise is twenty percent lift in whatever uh, you're doing in marketing. This is really the easiest twenty percent lift you'll have in your in in in, in, in any marketing uh, acquisition or retention. Um, channel or uh, or campaign you're doing and it's super hard to get that lift but if you just change the copy that's easy and we'll tell you what to do but <laughs> um turns out that you know you you have these like premium tomatoes you're selling to the market everybody's like okay just give me tomatoes like i haven't seen ai that writes an article um or stuff like that and then we have to like figure that out right how do we differentiate ourselves and then it, but people want tomatoes they want an ai that can help them save two weeks of work writing an article. And for us, it's always been um, building the features that are like basically the category definition of an AI writing assistant, um, but also building our, our copy intelligence platform at the same time. So we are, you know, plan our poll and saying, all right, we are that company that, that tells you that. So I think over time, um, and we see this in product numbers and retention and everything. Because people that, that we retain and like us use our uh, performance prediction heavily, and it's 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 just uh, going more and more that way uh, over time. You know, specifically after you know ChatGPT, we don't have to explain people to people that you know AI can write um, and and write really well. Um, now, um, an expert marketer wants to use LMs. There's a bunch of challenges. Okay, so first of all, the LM doesn't know your company, what worked for you in the past, what you should or shouldn't say about your 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 product or brand, and then any word does right. So any word that has like an infrastructure layer that connects your ad channels, your social channels, your emails, your website. We have a a pixel uh, um, um, and some code on your website, and then basically have to like index all that, aggregate that, and then. Um, create some inputs back into your uh, whatever LLM you want to use. You can use any words, you can use others. And then to generate high performing copy, um, not just save you time. So I think, I think there's more and more headspace into this can drive real performance. And that's super valuable for enterprises um, uh, as well as save you time, which is, you know, I think by now uh, obvious. Right. You touched on a lot of threads there that I want to pull on in this conversation, but let's kind of pick on specifically positioning and competition. Right now, it's a, a very competitive space. There's a, a lot of new companies that have popped up um, that are built on top of uh, ChatGPT or uh, OpenAI's uh, APIs, GPT-3, GPT-4. Um, so you have a lot of folks that are making similar claims. And of course, you have some that have really been around for a few years, maybe not as long as you have, um, that have uh, gotten a lot of attention like Jasper, uh, even copy.ai, a couple of those companies that um, are, they've raised a ton of money. Um, I think they raised over 100 million last year um, and are looking to dominate that 
AI writing assistant space. So talk to me about differentiation and positioning. Um, you said a few things that I think stood out as relates to any word with regards to uh, copy intelligence and performance writing. Um, those I think are, are unique angles that um, Jasper and the others don't necessarily focus on. Um, you also have some language on your site that talks about a post generative AI uh, marketing, um, which I'm not sure um, what you intend by that. So if you can elaborate and unpack, you know, how do you think about the positioning for any word and how has that evolved? Um, and then we could talk about like differentiation and, and um, you know, what it means, what, what it means like to work in a category that's so competitive right now. And I think general differentiation comes, if you, if you have a, a different vision for your product, it will come out in, in your product and in your, in your messaging. Um, we are riding the generative AI wave and it's been uh, great for us. Even after chat, we did it way better. Like uh, our cost per acquisition went down or, you know, way more traffic and way more uh, signups and conversions. But we've always been based on solving the problem of, you know, removing guessing from copywriting. This, that's been a problem before LMs. It's just a way more acute problem when you don't have a concentration bottleneck. Like if you write just two emails, then it's fine. Just A-B test those two. But if you, if you wrote way more. Um, and that comes out in, in, in our product is for, we can score your, 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 your copy and we can tell you how well we'll do for an age and a demographic, how to improve it for your target audience, for your you know, chosen uh, channel, age, demographic. There's different copy for different business goals. Like you want copy that converts, copy that engages. Um, and if you go into any word and you go into like something called the copy intelligence platform, you're going to basically see an analytics platform, your analytics for copy. Um, having said that, um, with generative AI, you can basically now apply analytics to, to writing. Um, and then you, we have that uh, AI writing assistant. So I think the AI writing assistant, it's, Pretty similar in most like to copy AI and Jasper and all those writers of the world. Um, yeah, like I said, there's like uh, table stakes for 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 uh, for leveraging LMs uh, cross marketing. Um, but I think the where we're seeing most of our growth now and um, especially enterprise growth, it's it's more in the data part. Uh, and I, we don't see a lot of competitors there or any. Uh, uh, because I, I think their vision, um, which is great, those are companies, great companies that you mentioned. I think their vision is to basically help people. Um, everybody can be a writer. Everybody can now, um, you know, leverage AI to make their work easier and and and, uh, and better. While we want to go to an ex expert content uh, creator and say, hey, LMs don't just write content. They really, really understand um, what works as well. So. 10 years ago, or even five years ago, if you want to train an algorithm to understand what copy worked better and you gave it tons of examples of thousands or millions, it wouldn't understand what, why, why one, one thing worked better than the other. It would basically guess, well, this one has emojis. This one has an exclamation mark. The deep understanding of context also allows you to train a model and say, well, I know that when you sell Pampers to parents, you should probably slightly try to scare them. Uh, to why they should be using that instead of like I don't know fear of missing out and that um, that's 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 a kind of like a, a different view of the whole space like I'm, I'm trying to we're trying to solve a different problem um, our challenge is basically the market not the the um, not the competitors like how do we uh, convince the market or basically uh, uh, teach the market that now you can basically create you know Take your best marketer and make them better, not just faster. It's uh, something that I was talking to um, Tony Beltramelli from Wizard a couple weeks ago. Um, they have a um, generative AI uh, interface uh, building and, and UI tool. And the challenge or um, the, what you need to do as a company in this space is you're not selling the AI, right? You're selling the value that the customer gets just like any other business needs to sell a solution to a problem that a customer has. AI happens to power it. And, you know, yes, there's a lot of buzz around it. So you get, like you said, you can ride the wave a little bit, but ultimately you need to sell the solution and the value that you're providing. Um, so making that clear to the user and not just leading with, you know, 
AI buzzwords because people don't buy AI, people buy the value or the solution behind it, right? I agree. That's always been kind of like the, like, you know, companies that have like their AI at the end. It was like, what are you, your AI software, like for, for somebody that comes from that space, that's like, you know, 10 years ago, people would say, yeah, we're a digital company. You know, that's, that's the world now. And so for me, it was always like, why call yourself an AI company? Just talk about your problem, whatever you're solving. I think what changed, and I think it's a profound change with foundation models, generative AI problem, um, uh, generative AI kind of models, you don't have to spend six months and have amazing data to, to create something uh, uh, meaningful. And you can go into any, I don't know, incumbent or any space and I think disrupt it um, with something that, you know, move faster, be more accurate, be a generative, like an AI first company. I think that's that's real. Not in all verticals and not in all categories. For instance, in our space, from my perspective, you know, if you're if you're writing an article with AI and, you know, that's, that's uh, you can do a lot there, but you can guess that the incumbents will basically also have what, you know, a lot of value like uh, you know, Google Docs or Microsoft, if not already, like they're, they're, they're going to help you write these, these articles. But I think in other spaces, there's a lot of opportunity to disrupt um, um, just with the fact that you're building your product like AI first. I think that's um, that's a real opportunity for lots of founders. Right. Uh, from a capability standpoint, um, speaking of positioning, obviously the customer is at the center of that. So I think you talked a little bit about kind of who you're targeting and how you're um, a little bit different from some of the other uh, tools that are out there. But can you drill into your ICP a little bit, your ideal customer profile? Um, how did you get there? How, how did you learn who that is? I'm assuming that there was some experimentation. Usually there is. Um, talk to me about that journey and, and where you landed with that. Ideally, we start with performance marketers. So they'll run ads and they'll measure them or they'll do some um, um, growth marketers. So they'll, they'll A-B test copy on the website or emails. Um, so everybody that like a person within the team that is in charge of, of, of performance, but also needs copy and needs some help with it. Um, um, and, and yes, yeah, it, it took us time to kind of like, um, to, f you know, fine tune that, right. So how much is that person spending on ads for them to care? Um, and, um, um, where do we start with? So like, if we start with the Google ads team, we can show value very, very quickly. Like, you know, just, if you're spending a hundred thousand dollars a month and you're using any word to write your copy, you're, you're, you're going to see, uh, Twenty thousand dollars back um, just by changing your copy, and then we can convince you to uh, use any word in other other channels. And um, initially, when we started, we're seeing a lot of blog writers, just general content marketers and copywriters using uh, the tool, and we're still seeing them today, and that's fine. Um, um, to get them to stick around and 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 you know and, and accrue value from from any word. Um, they can use any word for, for its, uh, you still get out of the box, like our, our performance prediction based on any words data across all channels. Um, but you, if you really care about performance, um, then you'll upgrade with any word. And then that's where our ICPs come in. So the, the performance marketers really care. Uh, copywriters kind of care. Like you think about writing itself, generally the, the person that writes content a lot of time in marketing teams isn't even, doesn't even have access to performance or they're not incentivized. We think that will change, and it's changing over time. Now that that, that everybody's a writing on a team, like everybody will use some sort of LM based tool to write something, and we don't think there's going to be a um, like a winner takes all. Like you, you might use AI from Notion, or you might use Jasper, or you might use uh, Google Docs. It doesn't really matter. You still have to tell the LM what to write about, and you still have to understand what to publish. Um, uh, and if you really care about performance, then you'll go to any word. And if you don't, you just use uh, other tools, which should do a, a great job. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, very common that writers and sometimes even content marketers are not um, as close to the data and the, perf as, and the performance as uh, you know, paid, paid media um, or what's called performance marketing. Uh, which is unfortunate, and I, I agree with you. I, th I think it is changing. And I, I hate to, to harp on 
competitors um, because you know it's. I understand that that you know you're building something unique, but it's also I think it's important for founders in our audience that are building in in competitive space, and there are lots of tools that that pop up, uh, especially now that it's becoming easier and easier to stand up a company, um, even in the AI space where uh, so many things are available um, out of the box to you. How do, how do you answer that question um, about defensibility, right? When you're, let's say, you're fundraising and, and VC say, you know, how are you going to compete with Jasper or Pencil or um, or Google and, and, my, and Microsoft? Um, you have articulated a really clear vision. Um, is that enough? Is there um, is there a TAM expansion that's necessary in order to really um, articulate that? Um, differentiation and, and uh, defensibility of, of your company and of your growth? Anyone collected seven years of data that's very, very accurate around what will work. You can't just get that data by, I don't know, scraping the internet, you know, just public posts or stuff like that. It's, 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 uh, it's not going to work. Um, is, do some companies have similar data? Yeah, really big companies, right? And then would they, can they kind of try to build uh, any word? Possibly if, if, if they they're, they're really cared, uh, but which is, I don't think it's their focus. Um, so we knew where, you know, where our defensibility comes from uh, going into any word. That's one of the reasons we actually launched any word. This is why uh, we thought this was defensible. We were thinking about this problem like, okay, everybody can use an LLM. Like, it's easy to use a foundation model. You can train your own. It doesn't, doesn't, there's no, um, yeah, everybody can stand up uh, the technology and the company. But we knew that where, where our, our, our bread was buttered. And um, you can look at all these, uh, these competitors. It's not, you're not going to see someone that can claim to predict performance for your ad. Um, uh, and and it's not a coincidence uh, you you have that that your your technology has to work and your prediction has to work and you have to have really really accurate and good data and you have to have lots of it so you have to have a model that's seen lots of examples of across industries and um and and then 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 your accuracy for performance can can work so proprietary data is one is one differentiator yeah i i think i think that uh Obviously, if, if 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 there's a new space and you're you know there's a race to, to being a leader, I think that you can you can also win like that. I, mean, I think uh, a lot of the big winners in the you know the last uh, I don't know evolution from desktop to mobile, for instance, there was just like the early companies that had uh, great execution and then uh, an accurate vision about what they want to. But the first ones often don't win, right? So if you think of like the the browser wars, uh, there were you know. 10 or 15 before Chrome and, and search wars and um, even mobile, right? Uh, the iPhone came out in what, 2007. There was plenty of mobile devices before then, and BlackBerry and others. Um, so it, being first to market isn't necessarily the, the strength that people assume it is uh, when it comes to, to capturing that market because you spend so much time educating the market and, and bringing customers. And like you mentioned, now that customers um, and, and, and the public knows about generative AI, that's a boon to your, to your adoption, right? You don't need to convince them that an AI can do it. Now it's just table stakes. Now you just need to convince them why uh, any word is better than anything else that's out there, right? Um, what about the model itself? So if I understand correctly, you, you're not built on top of um, GPT-3, which is most of those uh, products are. Um, you guys um, train drone models from, from the get-go. Is that a differentiator or that's just kind of a... a sort of how the sauce is made sort of decision that doesn't necessarily have a huge uh, impact on the product. I, I don't think it matters that much. I, th I think, first of all, we use our own models for most of the uh, templates and use cases, especially when we need uh, low latency and we need to really fine tune a model and, and have high accuracy in prediction. But if you're like, some of our, our, our features are built on, on top of uh, foundation. Okay, we'll, we'll just uh, plug into an API. There's no... If you think about software development and you 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 go to a customer and you show them some sort of very thin early mock and they especially enterprise and say yes I like it and you go and build it. Ten years ago with AI you couldn't do that right you couldn't say hey do you want this and they say yes and you, then you go back to the model and it doesn't work and it takes you like three months to figure it out and it doesn't work um, with the foundation model or you can do that again you can just go. 
really prototype really fast, you'll have something that kind of works most of the time. And once you have product market fit or somebody likes it, then you can go back and, 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 uh, and, and improve it. So that's how we've been uh, approaching uh, development uh, here. Early on, we just built our own models. And it was way slower. Like we were like, whoa, like we can just now create all these amazing use cases on top of a foundation model. And then once we kind of like know exactly what we want to fine tune, we can go and do some post-processing or pre-processing and, 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 and really affect the, the model itself uh, or, or host it and fine tune it. Got it. Uh, let's go back to your growth and acquisition. Um, we talked about SEO, paid acquisition, um, user reviews, uh, community, I think is important for you, right? You have a Facebook community of 10,000 plus users. Uh, how have you leveraged that and any other, um, methods or channels that you've used to enhance uh, word of mouth referrals? Um, anything you can tell us about your growth there? So we obviously leverage, uh, influencers and, and affiliates uh, as well. Um, the people that use the product a lot, we approach them and say, hey, what do you like? Especially if they're within our ICP. Um, so they, they'll, they can tell a great story about why any word worked for them and how it's, it's different. Um, we, we use the, uh, the community a lot to uh, test new ideas around products. To, um, it's, 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 it's a great uh, channel for us to, to understand what our customers are looking for. Um, and just a channel to, to, to basically, you know, interview people. Um, sometimes they don't even wait for us. Like we want, you know, uh, this to change or, or, uh, we're looking for, for, for this feature. Um, and, and that got, comes with, with, a, with push, which is also great. Um, we also see them helping out each other, right? So this whole space is new and you're building some sort of, uh, application, and people use it differently than what you thought or how you thought. Um, then you see people in the community helping each other. For instance, from our perspective, there's there's basically two paradigms to to generative AI. One, you 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 you, you enter a bunch of words like as a, as a seed, and you get a lot of great ideas um, really quickly. And if it's long form, that saves you tons of time. That's like one paradigm. And the other one is you know what you want to write. You have an email, like a 20% off Christmas, whatever, or, and it's like, you already, and you just want to have improvements of that, but you don't have, you don't need ideas, uh, like completely new. Um, and that's how we mapped kind of like the usage in the world. And we saw through the community that, you know, people were using, um, uh, these two kind of like feature sets in the product intermittently, like they, they didn't really understand that nuance. Um, and today, like post ChatGPT. Um, and to your point, uh, what's a post, what's a post LM world, um, post GPT, people are actually using to actually write a prompt. Like they're, 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 they're used to that. They're actually already expecting to tell the AI what to write. And then, you know, our, that through our community, we kind of like understand like what, how that should affect how people adopt with our, uh, adapt our problem, uh, our product and, and work with it. Um, just to go back to your point about what's a post, uh, LLM, uh, or generative AI world for marketers. Uh, that world looks differently. So before, um, before you had LMs, you used to have like a marketing, maybe two people that would write um, your content marketers and they would provide copy and content for every channel uh, on the team. There'd be experts. They have some institutional knowledge about what works, like what, what actually worked in the past. Like they understand their space really well. Um, and they had an understanding of what the brand uh, guidelines look like and what the brand wants to be. After LLMs, they're not needed to write content. They approve content. Like, so you'll use whatever tool you want, the person with running the ads, the person with the, uh, the emails. And so now we have 10 people writing content, generally. They are not experts. They have zero institutional knowledge, so they don't know what worked and what didn't work. And that's like a, a new problem. The problem just basically about like moved from writing to, you know, copy management, asset management. Um, oh, I've done this in the past and we've, we've tried this. It didn't work. Um, and that used to be a nice to have, like kind of a pain before, but now it's a real pain. Like you're generating all this content and really kind of make heads or tails of it. Um, just go back to your point, sorry, to what's a post LM 
I've already in, in my work um, shifted a, a lot from hiring writers to hiring editors um, because you don't need a writer to write anymore for in, in most cases. Um, how do you see the um, generative AI space changing marketing departments specifically over the next, let's say, one, three and 10 years, both in terms of like how, how they're structured and what they're producing, but also, I guess, in terms of job loss and, 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 and productivity and, and our you know, are they going to be replaced? And, you know, what kind of, are we, are we talking about like a 10 to one ratio? Any, any thoughts on that or any dare to make any predictions there? The way I see this, this is like a smart calculator. Um, not a, and a calculator, you know, is not threatening to a mathematician. Mathematicians are not scared of calculators, right? So I'm um, computer scientist is a mathematician in a way, you know, you can, there used to be days where people used to do long arithmetic by themselves, right? And then a calculator does that. There still has to be a person that sets the, the, the equation. Like, what are we trying to solve for? What are the parameters for that? What's the strategy? Who, what's our target audience? And then have the calculator write it in 50 different ways, right? So, uh, and, and how will that affect the job market? Yeah, I, th I think at the low end where you're, you know, you had the person that was just helping uh, people write meaningfully well i don't know in english kind of like, um good content where people had needed help with that because maybe your your english isn't that good and you need help with that and i think that is where you know ai is is, is going to be very dominant at the higher end i think like i said you still need the experts you need someone to define like what what actually works what do we want to say about ourselves uh, what do we try in the past and then and then that is, uh, um, so like, an, I don't expect the, the makeup of the uh, marketing team to change, maybe the, the job description a bit, but you're still going to have that content strategist, the content expert, copywriter, and they're still going to have to basically learn how to use these tools, but they're, they're, um, they're still going to have to have an opinion and editing and stuff like that. For how long though? I mean, thinking about like, you know, multi-agents where you have different models that are working together, prompting each other and, and um, uh, interacting with each other. Does that still hold true where you, you need that uh, human in, in the middle? Any word wants to be data-driven writing. We don't want to call ourselves a writing assistant. That's a human uh, decision and that still matters, right? So we want to position ourselves in a certain way because there is a lot of strategic you know, considerations about where we're going and, and, and it's just not, not anywhere. All of our customers also have uh, a perspective about how they want to present themselves based on their strategy, right? And how they position themselves. Um, can AI do that? Yeah, well, not great. Like, doesn't matter if it's the smartest they have in the world, read everything. You're bringing a new in, in, innovative uh, uh, product to the market. There, there is, you, you, you probably could ask you know, AI, you know, give me a bunch of ideas and they're all going to sound great, but not all of them are going to be great. And, um, and I think, uh, eventually you have to have conviction and some sort of intuition about what works. And that comes from an understanding of your space and understanding of your customers and understanding of your product and understanding of, and, and, and this calculator has seen some stuff, but it hasn't seen it doesn't really have the nuance for that. So, um, yeah, I don't think that is being going to get replaced. I'm not one of those people that says, well, AI is going to take over the world. That's, you know, it's scary. And I'm not, I don't, it, it's a statistical word guesser. That's just basically that. It sounds cool, but it's a, it's a magic trick. It's a pro trick. Now it is, but you're, you're saying that, that it's, that even those that are predicting five, 10 years out that the with the rate of expansion or, or improvement that we're seeing. Um, I don't want to get too far into the conversation around AGI and artificial general intelligence, uh, but you're, you're not, you're not buying that. You're, you're still seeing it as it's just predicting the next word, which is what it's doing today. Right. It's a, it's a transformer engine predicting. There is going to be better and better applications for it, especially with reinforcement learning and you're gonna, and, but yeah, people were scared of computers. Yeah, putting aside the the you know the scary um, science fiction type uh, scenarios that are dominating the news right now, but even just kind of the day to day of 
what we're already seeing where a lot of blog posts, a lot of content, um, ad content, news stories uh, is being written by AI, generated by AI. How do you see the consumers reacting to that? Um, you know, I, I've seen some parallels. People have, have used the example of um, uh, Adobe Photoshop, right? That like we had photography, we had uh, art and then we had photography and then we had photography and we had, we had Photoshop and consumers adjusted, right? So they know that, you know, magazine covers are edited and they have that in their mind and, and they know that. Um, do you think that consumers are okay with their ads, their, their, their media, their news being written by AI? Do you think they're just going to take that with a grain of salt and realize, yeah, it's probably, you know, 70% AI, 30% human, or, or how do you think consumers will react? I think for text or for language, I think it's different than for images. I think there's an, uh, it's very hard to understand what plagiarism actually is now. Like, what is plagiarism? Like, if, if, if I read an article and I read five articles or I read three books and now I, like, summarize them by myself or I use the AI, what's the difference? Like, right? I basically summarize them now. Is this, like, new? Is a derivative of, of the original content? So I think that's, like, an issue. I think from a, uh, a consumer perspective, it won't matter. You're already, from a, from a personal point of view, from a consumer point of view, you already are exposed to infinite amount of content. There's, there's a lot of people in this world. They're writing lots of stuff. They're all trying to reach you in their feet. Why would you, like, you, you, you're still going to get, I don't know, you open your, I don't know, uh, your, your LinkedIn feed. You're still going to read 50 posts. So AI wrote them, some of them, or AI assisted in writing some of them. You're not going to be able to tell the difference. Unless, um, yeah, you're not. You, there's no way you can fact check. You can't. Um, some writers, some human writers are better than others. Um, so I think there's still going to be that whole authority type of thing. So I'm going to read articles for the New York Times because I trust that source. If the New York Times uses AI or not, I don't care. They might use word processor. I don't care either. Um, I just care that you know they're telling me what you know what I want to read, or maybe they're doing their job, or, and uh, the perspective I want to get, or, or something like that. Um, I'm not. I think it's a different issue with images, which I, I don't want to, I'm, I'm not an expert and I don't, I, I, I don't claim to be, but plagiarism in text is a whole new thing. So for instance, and that is something that has to change, right? So who's the author <laughs> who gets the credit? Um, and uh, I'm looking at search for instance and Google, how, how do they like figure that out now? It's really easy to, uh, bypass um, plagiarism injectors with AI now. And then does that really matter anymore? Um, that's like an evolution of technology that I think we're going to have to like address it differently. What is authorship now? It, 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 that's something that I think has to get, has to get redefined from a consumer perspective. I don't think it matters. Right. But from a marketer's perspective for the longest time, um, marketers, you know, I, I hate to admit it, but we were writing content more for Google than for the user in a lot of cases, right? Um, because that was the game. We needed to, to rank in search in order to get traffic. Um, and then, you know, hopefully it, it serves the, the customer as well. And, and that leads to them, you know, uh, consuming other information on the site, but the, um, content needed to be found. Um, Google, they started um, taking some content, putting it on the page with, uh, you know, answer box and, and, and things like that. But for the most part, they just gave you a link and sent you to, to the site and said, you know, if you like it, take it. And if not, there's another link. There's uh, a million more links behind it if you, if you want to keep looking, right? Um, OpenAI, obviously, ChatGPT doesn't give you any um, sources and just gives you an answer. Sometimes it hallucinates, sometimes it, it plagiarizes, um, and it's up to you to figure it out. And then you have Bing and, and Perplexity.ai and a few others that are, um, kind of in between, they're giving you a result um, that's AI generated, but they're also giving you uh, sources. Um, what are your thoughts on on kind of the changing SEO landscape and maybe just even the the search landscape? Do you think people are going to start moving away from uh, Google search and using uh, a, a chatbot for um, certain queries instead? Uh, any thoughts on on search and SEO? I think if you want to source or not depends on the application. A chatbot and search are not the same thing. You might leverage some of the chatbot or LLM kind of like modalities in your in your search experience, but they're not the same thing. Um, I agree that if you're if you were looking for questions to your just general answers and you had to like search for them across the web, you don't do you're gonna need you're not gonna need to do that anymore. Like you can just hey, what's the best place to visit in Thailand? I don't know, and then you get an answer instead of like looking at 
try different review websites and stuff like that. So that definitely is going to change. But sometimes you're looking for something specific and, and Google's kind of business, you know, objective is to get you, uh, yes, what you asked for, but not only, right? What are, what, what people find useful and, you, you know, it's, it's, and, 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 and still in, in that perspective, they, they have the, uh, they're still very dominant about what people find useful um, uh, as an answer to a query. So for them to basically add this like very smart summarized answer on top of what, hey, you might want to, you know, check this new product out that you haven't heard of, it's relevant to your query. Um, I think they still have that uh, going for them and, and that's going to be valuable. But they, they, that, there's going to be less search, less traffic, obviously. And that should be expected by everybody in the space. Like everybody that's trying to, yeah, you're trying to be found, but 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 I, I think Google is always. I'm not I'm I'm not privy to what's going on there, but I I think that they're trying to solve. Uh, you know, how do I provide value for the query? And that value is. It's not clear what that is. It's not just giving you, the accurate answer you want, but also exposing you to links that might uh, create some value for you as well. Got it. Um, any other thoughts on just the impact that AI is going to have on society as a whole. We had an episode on uh, AI ethics. We've had an episode on uh, AI in the metaverse. Um, you know, it's, it's an exciting time to be alive. Um, things are changing quickly and it's going to have profound impact, I think, in a lot of areas of society, government, corporations, et cetera. So any um, thoughts there, any um, uh, concerns that you have about what's happening and, and also from a responsibility standpoint, do you think that companies have a responsibility to rein in AI um, or both, both from like a, a dangerous kind of like the, the scary scenario of AGI, but also from just job loss and, and displacement type um, consequences? Or do you think that it's, you know, government's responsibility, companies just need to innovate and governments need to take care of that? Any any thoughts there? That's way over my pay grade. Uh, um, I think... I think if you're talking about government regulators, I think I think they're still trying to solve social media, right? So I think I think that's changing the world. And I'm not, you know, I think most people agree, not in the best way. Yeah, it has changed the world, not in the best way, not 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 in the way that people thought, you know, 15 years ago. You know, when the internet is going to democratize information, everybody's going to have access, and it's going to be great. Now they're all going to be better for it. And now, you know, everybody has their own set of information, <laughs> and and, and they're exposed to that. And I think that's way more profound than somebody using AI to do what they couldn't do. Like you could hire a writer and it's not that expensive before. Or you could hire um, lots of writers. If, and and, and, and so, so I, I, I'm not... So it, it, how government is going to regulate it? Some problems are hard. I don't see this. This is getting sorted out by regulators or government. I think technology is going to just move forward um, really fast, and then you know the job market, business models are going to have to adapt. People are going to have to adapt, and uh, and like every disruption, some good things will come out of it. Some bad things. I'm actually. I think this is uh, the same disruption that computers had. Some good, some bad, but ultimately more good than bad, right? The efficiency increase um, was very beneficial to everyone. And yeah, there's some bad actors using it uh, the wrong way. I'm more concerned about the effects of uh, information bubbles and social media and stuff like that, where that's just hasn't been solved yet. And we're still kind of like fine, trying to understand how to, how to deal with that. I like your optimism. Yeah, Niamh, I'm really enjoying this, but we uh, are coming up on time here. So we close out with a lightning round. Uh, I'll ask you a few questions. Um, tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. Sound good? Yep. All right. So uh, what book, podcast, or newsletter do you find yourself recommending most often? I'm, I'm going to say to Sam Harris. You know that guy? Sure. I think he has, he brings in different, uh, and also Lex Friedman. I think they're like bringing in lots of uh different people for different aspects. I, I actually enjoy, you know, reading about generative AI, but not only. Like I, I, I think uh, um, just having a, a, a big range of topics, you know, just about chess or uh, um, or anything. Um, 
Uh, so that's kind of like, uh, that's my main, my main, uh, I don't know, non-work time uh, uh, spent. Yeah, I disagree with Sam on uh, a lot of topics, but I really like his approach and his, his thoughtfulness. Um, and, and Lex also his curiosity and the, the guests he has on. If I have the time, I try to listen to very long episodes though. Uh, uh, next question. When hiring, what's your favorite interview question to get to know someone? It's a bunch of questions, but I'm trying to get, I'm trying to understand if they're curious. Um, I really, really want to know if they're curious about things. So typically I would ask them like for your last job, if you had one tip to give me, if I were going to do your last job, I, I was, you know, gonna being hired and there's like one tip that you would give me to, to do well. And that tip is not obvious, like something that you've learned and you can, you know, pass that on to me. What would that tip be? If you don't have that tip, I'm like, okay, so maybe you're like somebody else did the hard problems or solved it. Usually if you solve the hard problem, you would remember it. It's not like something that you don't remember. Either either you didn't solve hard problems or um, um, or you, you know either either they weren't hard or or you didn't solve them. So I want to I want to I want to understand if you if you remember if you solved a hard problem and typically a hard problem is something that you kind of like, didn't work, didn't work, didn't work, then it worked. And if you did that, you'd remember it. <clears throat> Most people can tell you. I remember a, a code problem from 15 years ago I solved, which was hor horrible. Like a two months, took me two months to solve that bug. It was a hardware problem. And we're like, I'm a software engineer. It was like the memory kept like, I don't know, like uh, crashing. And anyway, and, and I remember trying 50 different ways to solve it. And eventually we solved it. And because it was, it took time and iterations, then I'd expect anybody doing something uh, worthwhile to, uh, to know that. Yeah. Stick, it sticks with you. I like that one. Uh, what's one thing you'd like to change about the startup world? I think there are different types of startups. And I think, um, I think it's not clear. Like, some startups want to be the New York Yankees. Like, I want to be the best team in the world. And I want to be that. And, and some startups are not like that. Like, they're like, okay, I want to be a, a company. And I, and I want that type of culture. And, and I think when you know new employees go into a, a startup it's not really clear about what kind of company they're going into everybody's saying the same things but it's not um i try to be as very transparent with people joining the team hey look we're trying to be the new york yankees the new york yankees practice a lot <laughs> and that's what we want to be and as well you, you know there's other great companies out there that's like you know they're not trying to be the new york yankees they're either already are the new york yankees or they're trying to be something else. That's fine. I want to. I want to be my def, my definition of a startup is that, and it's not everybody's definition. I think uh, it should be more clear. I think to to everybody, people should be more transparent about it. I like that you referenced the Yankees as that example because I'm a big Yankees fan. So thank you for that. <laughs> but they are a very particular organization. You know that they have very specific rules uh, and how you conduct yourself. All right. Last question: If you could have coffee with any historical figure, who would you choose and why? <laughs> Right now, I want to have coffee with a current Israeli prime minister. He's not historical, but I need to, I have some, uh, I have some issues. <laughs> yeah, I want to talk to him about some stuff. Um, okay. I can accept that. Well, Yaniv, I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much. Um, any final words you'd like to share with the audience? And also, how can people find you if they want to continue the conversation? Yeah, I'm at Yaniv at anywhere.com. So email me and um, try our product free to try uh, at uh, anywhere.com. I really enjoy this. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I hope, uh, hope I gave you some, some insights. Absolutely. Thank you, Aniv. Wishing you all the best.